There we go. Okay, Old Testament lesson is Ezekiel. I don't know why I feel like this is Deja Vu. Do we have this sometime earlier? Or maybe it was a different part of Ezekiel. But um, Actually, the Old Testament and the Gospel lesson kind of fit with the Epistle today, or this week, uh, because the Epistle is about... Uh, uh, handling the weak and uh, not being a stumbling block, and a stumbling block is mentioned in the gospel, and here it's talking about our responsibility toward other people. So let's uh, start by reading responsibly the words um, that are part of the appointed lesson this week from Ezekiel 33. Son of man, I made you a watchman for the people of Israel. So hear the word I speak. And give them warning from me. When I say to the wicked, you wicked person, you will surely die. And you do not speak out to dissuade them from their ways. That wicked person will die for their sin. And I will hold you accountable for their blood. But if you do warn the wicked person to turn from their ways and they do not do so. They will die for their sin. Though you yourself will be saved. Okay, do you have an alarm system on your house or car? Uh, no, motorcycle. Just, just motorcycle. Just got a ring doorbell. Just got a ring doorbell. We haven't broken down and done that. Like I said, my son's got, got five of them now. Got, got tired of the doorbell bashers in the neighborhood. Uh, <laughs> my dog's also scared Yeah, they don't bark until after the kids are So has it, do you, to your knowledge, has uh, an alarm ever scared away a crook? Yeah, that's something you probably don't know, unless you've got a ring doorbell and you see somebody running. But somebody said to me, I can't remember where it was the other day. They said, oh, I, where was it? I don't know. But somebody's car alarm went off, you know. It was beep and beep and beep and beep and beep, and beep and, you know. And, and uh, a guy looks at me and he says, have you ever seen a car alarm go off where somebody was actually trying to break into the car? <laughs> and I thought, no, I haven't. <laughs> I've seen and heard car alarms. But, yeah. Well, that's what I do so often. Yeah, if you bend the wrong way when you get your keys in your pocket, off it goes. And that's the next question. Does it ever give false alarms? Oh, yeah. Absolutely. On the other hand, um, to thinking about alarm systems, uh, uh, most of us have smoke alarms mm -hmm. or carbon monoxide alarms. That's actually what uh, helped my son's house to be discovered is the fellow who lived down the road from him uh, heard the um, smoke alarms going off. Wow. And, and he's down a little bit. He's not right across the road, but... Um, yeah, yeah. So thankfully, whoever did it didn't dis disarm the smoke alarms yeah. because um, because they were able to get there quickly then. Okay, what's the one way the watchman can fail in his job? Now, we read verse 8, uh, but somebody want to read verse 6 for us? But if the watchman sees the sword coming and does not blow the trumpet to warn the people, the sword comes and takes the life of one of them, the man will be taken away because of his sin. But I will hold the watchman accountable for his blood. So between that and verse 7, um, what's the job of the, what's the one way a watchman can fail in his job of verse 8? Not giving a warning. Yeah. To not warn somebody when you know that they're headed in the wrong direction and, um, Makes you think of the guys in the crow's nest on the Titanic. Uh, <laughs> you know, they're kind of set up for failure. Set up for failure. <laughs> but not to warn somebody when you see them on the way. And that's a difficult uh, job to do. What does success look like for the watchman? Somebody want to read verses 1 to 5 for us. The word of the Lord came to me, son of man, speak your Speak to your people and say to them, When I bring the sword against a land, and the people of the land choose one of their men and make him their watchman, and he sees the sword coming against the land and blows the trumpet to warn the people, then if anyone hears the trumpet but does not heed the warning, and the sword comes and takes their life, their blood will be on their own head. Since they heard the sound of the trumpet but did not heed the warning, their blood will be on their own head. If they had heeded the warning, they would have saved themselves. There you go. 
So, um, so what does success look like? Pay attention to the time. Yeah, <laughs> pay attention. Don't get yeah. your phone out, go in the basement. Yeah. <laughs> well, you think about that sometimes when you see the um, hurricanes and all that kind of stuff, you know, and there's those people they interview who stayed in their home. Mm -hmm. They maybe sent their family away and, you know, um, but they felt that they needed to stay for some but reason. They got to hold the yeah, and you wonder how many people who die in those kind of situations have made that decision. Mm -hmm. They've heard the warning, but they say, I'm going to ride it out for one reason or another. I want to protect my property or whatever, but they lose their life, and mm -hmm. then that property isn't theirs anyway. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> um, but there's also so much variance, unless it's just a huge storm. I was the person who grew up on the East Coast. And you know, there's a huge storm, and you don't know if it's going to veer your way or not. Right. Mm -hmm. And now, you know, everybody just goes like lemmings, go out, it goes out of there, and so well, I don't. And that's the danger of too many warnings. Yeah. It's that boy that cried wolf. You know, you become immune to the yeah. Like, yeah. warning. Because their their predictions are not always accurate as to where it's going to strike land and. I do have to think about the watchman, though. I mean, you have some. Oh, I was just gonna Go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead, Dan. Well, I was just. I mean, are we supposed to be watchmen for everybody? Is that it? So they're putting the uh, <laughs> owners on me. I'm. I'm gonna get to that. Okay. Right now he's talking. Like this section. <laughs> right now he's talking to Ezekiel. Right. Right now he's talking to Ezekiel. Why is he talking to Ezekiel? So you always got to look at the immediate context. What's the immediate context? He's the watchman, and God's going to bring his judgment down on the nation. He's, and why is he bringing his judgment down on the nation? Because of their idolatry. <coughs> um, Ezekiel, when he describes that, it's... Uh, when they bring the idols into the temple courts, you know, they had idols and they would do idol worship out here and worship the true God in here. But when, when they brought those idols into the temple courts, that's when God said, that's all I can stand and I can't stand no more. <laughs> right? You're done. I've had it up to here, you know. And until that happened, he kept sending them prophets to watchmen. To warn them, but um, you know, maybe it's a case where they thought, that, well, the watchmen were crying wolf, you know, that it really wasn't that bad or it was never going to happen. And sometimes that's what, remember, the false prophets would say, oh, God will never let that happen to us. Yeah, that's right. So, so the, the guy who um, got the warning and decided, you know, he's going to hold down the fort, God will take care of us. So the water comes and he gets up on the roof. And a boat comes and says, we're here to take you. And he says, don't worry, God will take care of you. And then a helicopter comes and <laughs> God will take care of us. And the helicopter goes and he perishes in the flood. And he sees God up in heaven and he says, how come you didn't help me? And he said, well, you ignored the boat. You ignored the helicopter. What else can I do? <laughs> yeah. so I sent you a boat. I yeah. sent you a helicopter. But you didn't respond. Mm -hmm. yeah. so, I mean, that's, that's kind of where a lot of people are today, you know. And then when God doesn't do anything, supposedly, then they blame God for it. Because he didn't do what they wanted. He didn't do what they wanted. Now, the other side of that is that you and I are the captains of the boat and the helicopter pilots who are sent in God's name to help people who are perishing. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, Karen. I was just going to what why did... Uh, is there some significance to the fact that he uses the term the sword? Why, why does he call it the sword? Because literally it was going to be the devastation that was going to be brought by by the enemies from Assyria and Babylon. Okay. Yeah, yeah, and and it was going to be absolutely devastating because they they practiced a scorched earth policy and. And it also was devastating because, um, you know, they, so I, I kind of really watched the Ukraine thing. I just like kind of the military analysis stuff. So there are a couple of websites I go to to watch that. And, 
And sometimes you wonder, well, why are they hitting what they're hitting in a particular place? And, and, and right now, uh, Ukraine's trying to destroy a lot of the supply lines because if the supplies can't get to the troops, you know, um, they're going to have some difficulty. And, and unfortunately, in their day and age, you didn't need, you know, bullets because it was arrows and speed. You had arrows, but those could be made on the ready if you had arrow makers with you. Um, you just needed, you know, the, the pieces and somebody who knew what they were doing. Um, spears, you know. Um, now they might have some catapults and that kind of thing to, and, and ladders to, to attack walls and stuff like that. But, but you know, the, the kind of supplies they need, needed were primarily food Right? And water. And where do they get it from? Yeah. The people they're conquering. The people they're conquering. And it's just like so many of the places I've seen where they've, you know, kind of rooted out some of the Russians. Where were they? Well, they were in people's residences, often in the basement. And, you know, that's where they hold up. And, and of course, what happened to those people? Those people are either dead or gone. And, and that's why it was such a devastating thing when the armies came through. And, um, and so there were other people who were saying, no, God would never let this happen to us, you know. And, um, but Ezekiel is the watchman. I mean, last week it was Jeremiah, remember? And, and uh, he was pretty disheartened because nobody was listening to the warning and there were all these false prophets and, you know, so, so we'll get to your question in just a minute. <laughs> what other problem do the Israelites have because of their sins? That's in verse uh, 10. Somebody want to read verse 10 for us. Son of man, say to the house of Israel, this is what you are saying. Our offenses and sins weigh us down, and we are wasting away because of them. Then how then can we live? How then can we live? So what else are they going through? Remorse, guilt, and I would say they're probably the consequences of their sins, which are was devastating. And um, so we're going to sing this Sunday because it's about the week. Uh, I think the opening hymn is uh, um, "Are We Weak and Heavy Laden?" Okay, cumbered with a load of care, and here's where they were cumbered with a load of care. Um, okay. Um, now, what's God's response? Somebody want to read verse 11. Say to them, Surely as I live, declares the Sovereign Lord, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but rather that they turn from their ways and live. Turn, turn from your evil ways. Why will you die, O house of Israel? So God's pleading. Now this is a this is a significant passage for a couple of reasons. First of all, because it tells us the heart of God, which is He takes no pleasure in their death. Yeah, and it's not His desire. That's critical because you see, this is when we think about things that divide us in uh, Christianity. That's the next lesson. Um, there are things that are in God's word that divide us, and there are things that are not in God's word that divide us. But the things in God's word, this is one of those that divides us. Does God really want everybody to be saved? And this very clearly says yes. What denomination or theological um, theological? What am I thinking of? Uh, uh, yeah, their they're doctrinal. The theological doctrine that says just the opposite. Um, I'm Christian. A Christian church faith. It's the uh, strict Calvinist position, a double predestination. Okay, that God chooses some people to be saved, and. And, and that the Bible says, it talks about the elect, 
and it talks about predestination. But the, where they go is they say, well, if God chooses some people to be saved, then, and this it never says in the Bible, God must choose some people to be damned. That's double predestination. And, uh, and it, it's, it's a doctrine that divides. And um, so you'll, you'll only find that um, strictly followed in, um, or, or you only find that followed in strict uh, Calvinist or Reformed uh, teachings. Orthodox Presbyterians, there's not a lot of them. There's a church just down the road from my house that's one of the, I think, two or three Orthodox Presbyterian churches in the city of Milwaukee. And, um, and when I was on Vicarage in North Dakota, or South Dakota, and South Dakota, in the little town of Hamel, there were two existing churches yet. There was the Lutheran Church, and there was an Orthodox Presbyterian Church, <laughs> of all things. <laughs> and, um, and we shared a VBS, but the, the only way we shared the VBS is if we used LCMS materials. But it didn't make sense to have two BBSs in that little town um, uh, that had a gas station and a, kind of a general store, and that's about all that was left. You know, had more pheasants living in it than people. Kind of thing, you know? And uh, so I had a number of conversations with the Orthodox Presbyterian uh, pastor, and you know, I said, "So you can't say no to God." He said, "No, you can't say no to God." I said, but what if you do say no to God? He said, well, God will drag me kicking and screaming into his kingdom um, <laughs> if I'm predestined to be there. And that's always stuck with me, obviously. You know, it's an interesting perspective. And I know the Bible says you can say no to God. Jesus called some people to follow him, and some did, and some didn't and he said he didn't say to the ones that didn't you're going to follow me whether you like it or or not the doctrine of predestination is only used in the scripture when somebody is thinking about their own spiritual life so it's meant to be a doctrine of comfort for us how do i know that i was predestined i believe oh you mean how do we know yeah okay um, and, and when Paul teaches about the, that predestination, it's always in that context of comfort for the believer. It's never, and it's always about me, my experience in the, in the gospel. It's not about what God's doing in somebody else's life. And, there, and, and, and one of the challenges is, is, um, is that in this system, systematic way of doing theology there's a number of things that have to be true and and i'm probably not going to remember them all but they go by the acronym of tulip so t is total depravity do we believe that we're sinners totally so we say yes um uh unconditional grace do we believe grace is now Here's where we get in trouble. Limited atonement. You see, uh, what what they do when they see a verse like uh, John 3, 16, God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. When they see world, they, they mean believers. Those who are predestined to heaven. Jesus died for those who are going to be saved. So it's a limited atonement. He only atoned for the sins of those who are eventually going to be saved. That's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible says he that he died for all. Irresistible grace. That's the dragging and kiss, kicking into the kingdom of heaven. That's hilarious. Right? So that, they don't believe in free will. No. no free will. Um, not in the sense that... Um, that, that we would think of it. Yeah, because when it comes to your salvation, you might have free will about a lot of other things, but when it comes to your salvation, um, God is, if, if you're his predestined child, you're going to be there, and the P is the predestination. So we're, we have some problems is down here. Um, now, the other side of when you talk about free, free will is um, does that mean that um, it's my will that causes my salvation? 
See, that's the Free Will Baptists, and that's one of the th reasons why we have a lot of problems with their terminology um, when they say, you know, have you made your decision for Christ? And if you haven't made your decision for Christ, if you can't name the day or hour, some of the um, denominations believe that you decided and invited Jesus into your life, um, then you're not saved. I remember um, Jim Krieger, when I was here the first time, he had had a stroke, he was in the hospital, and you know, he delivered flowers to a lot of churches <laughs> through his business, and uh, I remember I went to visit him one time, and one of the pastors from one of the congregations was one of these kind of free will Baptists, and was in the hospital on him about, Jim, you have to invite Jesus into your heart, and he said, He's already here. He's already here, yeah. <laughs> and Jim, you know, was obviously, that's the last thing he needed somebody to be doing, but, um, you know, but it, it's that you've got to be able to name that day or hour. And, and, you name your baptism date. Here you go. <laughs> well, and, and I always say, I, you know, I have no conscious memory of not being a Christian. Right. It just doesn't exist in my brain. You know, there's no, there's no BC, there's no before Christ in, in my memory. Now there obviously was at a time sometime, but I can't tell you the day or hour that I all of a sudden went from non-faith to faith, how old I was, I, I, because I was obviously very small. So when, when my son decided to join the church that his wife is a member of, they, they use the baptism more like a confirmation type mm -hmm. thing. Right. And so he says, well, Mom, I want you to come to my baptism. And I said, I've been there. I don't need to go. I said, you feel that you need to have this as a confirmation because that's what it is. You go ahead and do what you need to do because you have to look at your wife. I get that. However, I was at your baptism. Mm -hmm. I don't need to go to well, and that's uh, the big difference between our understanding of baptism and uh, and especially the Anabaptist. Yeah, so changed, all of the they, they changed the definition mm -hmm. as opposed to it's something that I do to demonstrate my faith for God, right. rather than something that God it's does not for a sacrament. me. sacrament, and the thing is, they no. don't look at, at communion that way either. They well, they call them true. ordinances typically in their yeah. theological literature. In other words, God says do it, so you do it. It's an ordinance. Yeah. But it's, it's, yeah, it does not. The, and, and the action in the difference has to do with um, between an ordinance and a sacrament is, oops, got, that wrong. got to do it this way. Jesus should be on top, right? Is in the, if it's a sacrament, the action is this way. If it's an ordinance, I'm just saying yes, sir, to something I've been told to do. And the action is mine, not God's. And um, it makes a lot of people feel good, though, then. And that's what we've talked about before, is those feel-good churches. The fact that you're more in control of, of that grace than yeah. realizing it's a free it's gift. It's a free gift. And... Um, um, the way I always think about it, and I have an article about different kinds of verbs, stative and active verbs, and all that kind of thing. And, uh, and, and what, you, what it gets to is this. Is trust something you do, or is it something that somebody draws out of you? When I walk up to somebody new, I don't flip a switch and say, now I trust you. Right? That trust has to be... Right? It, it, it's something that develops because I find you trustworthy. Because uh, I see you keeping your word. I see you, if, if it's a confidence, keeping a confidence. I see you. In other words, it's what you do that leads me or draws that trust out of me. And I think about that when Jesus says, and I, even when I'm lifted up, will draw all men to myself. The trust is elicited by the person that you trust, and and um, and so even when you think about the thing, things like faith and belief and all of that, well, I believe you because you are believable. <laughs> I trust you because you're trustworthy. 
It's not like I just flip a switch and I make a decision. I am going to trust you. Uh -uh. That's not the way it goes in relationships with trust. Gospel literally means good news. What bad news is a part of the good news? <clears throat> Come on, you're all Lutherans here. And the bad news is that if you don't believe in Jesus and repent, you will live forever in misery. Yeah, the, the bad news is yeah. law and gospel, we say, right? It's... Uh, the wages of sin is death. We do believe in the total depravity of human nature that we are born sinners. Pardon? That was my confirmation. Oh, your confirmation verse? Yeah. Wages of sin is death. death. I hope you had the second half of that verse, but the free gift of God is eternal life. <laughs> 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 I focus on the first. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's always bad news. The good news isn't good unless there's bad there that, you know, otherwise it's just news news. What makes it good is the fact that we're in the condition that we're in and we need that that good news. And, so I, I was kind of focused on the trust stuff. Yeah. Um, I, you know, chaired the department for many years and you know, also in the military. And the, my focus of leadership was you know, I trust people until they give me a reason not to. Yeah. And you know, then, then Lord help. <laughs> but um, you know, if you wait, you know, I, I just don't think that's. I mean, I mean, I'm sure you're talking about a relationship with God, things like that, mostly. Right. But if you go through life and say, "Okay, I have to wait for you to prove yourself," I I just don't think you go. Well, then somebody's always going to let you down. Well, yeah, but you always give them that opportunity. Yeah. Yeah. No, I. Th I so there's a different personality about those who enter a relationship more trusting and those who are more cautious or, you know, Skeptical. that's true as well. But but you still... All the time. I mean, you're getting your car, you're driving on the road, you're trusting that everybody else is trying to follow the rules. <laughs> but you're cautiously watching them to make sure that they are trustworthy. And management is different than, let's say, friendship. Because management, someone has already vetted that Person. person, you know, they're they're in your employee for a reason, so you have to give them trust, or else you're never going to get a job done. Whereas a friend, you can meet someone and you can be friendly with them, but you still might not give them the keys to your house to watch your dog. You know what I mean? Yeah. So there's there's a different there's a different relationship. Yeah. Well, I I always when I met Dan, we were we were friends for over a year before he ever asked me out. Mm -hmm. And you know, in that time in the seventies, guys were just horrible when you went out on dates. Lecherous. Lecherous. <laughs> absolutely. And he was the first I beg your pardon. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, Mary was different. But the thing was is that I actually felt I could trust him and I think that opened the door for the relationship in the first mm -hmm. place. Because I never would have considered him as possible otherwise, because he was just a friend. And Ashley, when he asked me to marry him, I said, well, I don't want to lose the friendship. <laughs> well, this time our friendship. <laughs> really. And, you know, because sometimes that happens. But the idea is that I could I could really trust him with the things that we did and said. And, you know, because there'd be all this gossip around on a small campus and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, he was absolutely trustworthy. And that, that made a big difference to me in that kind of friendship. Yeah. And it lasted. Mm -hmm. So now that I'm your question, does God call you and every Christian to be a watchman? Yeah. Where do you learn that? It's, now you're not a watchman in the same way that Ezekiel is. I just had one at my door the other day. I couldn't believe it. It's 95 degrees and this guy's standing at my door wanting to talk about stuff. <laughs> Seriously, no. I, when you're when you're thinking about being a watchman, you and I are not a watchman in the same way that Ezekiel is. Ezekiel was given a specific task for a specific people at a specific time. Guess what your pastor is? 
he's given responsibility for a specific people for a specific time, right? Um, if anybody read the newsletter article that I wrote this time, um, I included a passage and it says to obey your leaders or submit to your leaders as those who have to give an account. And that's a different responsibility, you know, that I am responsible for your spiritual well-being and it's my job as best as I'm able to warn those who are headed down a wrong path as I see it and, and um, to encourage those on a right path. That's, that's my job. And it's a task God gives me when he calls me as a pastor in a particular place. That, that stops this week. I'm no longer responsible for you. And so if you see a if you see a big sigh of relief, sigh of relief. <laughs> <laughs> your shoulders all going up. Yeah. <laughs> well, and it's you know in, in here because and that's why some guys don't want schools or child cares because it's not just the congregation that you have, but now you're concerned about. Um, not just the administration side of it, but the spiritual welfare of your staff and of all the children who are in the school also come under your responsibility, all the kids who are in the child care. You know, and that's why um, one of the things the council tasked me with when I first came was trying to blend the ministries so that they weren't so siloed. They were very siloed. And, um, and that's why we had a baptism of a child care, you know, child in worship because we reach out to them we're they're part of our spiritual responsibility well, and, that was the whole idea in the first place why we got a child there and well then we never got there yeah well you have to be very very intentional about it and everybody in the leadership has to be intentional about it and you've got to have systems in place that do that and it's those systems i'll share with pastor steve when he comes you know, that when we know, for instance, when somebody's enrolled in the child care, and, and uh, that usually means the gal's pregnant. I have a devotion book called Expecting that takes you week by week through the pregnancy, and I have a handout for fathers and a how to bless your unborn baby sheet um, that, that we sent with a cover letter to that family and say, just know we're wrapping your child in prayer. Here's a way you can do it until this baby comes. When they're born, we have a little card that I have that says, children are a gift of the Lord, and we send them a congratulations. And by the way, if you want help with baptism, and you know, um, <coughs> we try to every year look at um, any older children who come in with families, either from the school or childcare, and say, who are, who don't have a church home, because we should be inviting them, and who, who aren't baptized. Now, the aren't baptized, if they're one of the groups that believes baptism is something you do, well, that provides, that, that, that means very often they're not gonna ask us to baptize, although we have had people, even in that situation, who asked us to baptize, and, um, and then when we shared it with the parents, they shared it with their pastor, and I remember it was a couple of years ago, we had a young girl who was baptized in her home church, probably earlier than they would normally do it, but because of what she'd learned about the blessings and benefits of baptism here, she wanted to be baptized. And so they baptized her in, I think it was a Pentecostal church. And, um, you know, so there are other ways that you can be a, a plant the seed. And yes, so that's different. Then, and then you got to think about, think about this is where Lutheran doctrine and vocation comes in. What's your station in life? Who are you responsible for? Well, obviously I made a commitment to my wife. The Bible says I'm to honor and take care of my parents. You know. Um, it also says I should do good, but especially to the household of faith. You know. And then there are those individual passages where Jesus says, if your brother sins against you, go to him when you're alone. And, all right? and then on the other hand, he says, if there's something between you and a brother, and that's a person in Christ that you're connected to, and uh, 
and you know that, first go and be reconciled them, and bring, then bring your gift to the altar. And the way I look at those two passages is it just tells you when somebody says, well, I'll, I'll forgive them if they forgive me, or I'll talk to them if they'll talk to me. I'm sorry that God, God puts you both on the hook. <laughs> it doesn't matter whether you're the offended or the offendee. <coughs> Your responsible is to, responsibility is to make peace with that person. And then obviously we have responsibility toward our children. There's a passage in Galatians where Paul says to the Galatian Christians, he says, if you see a brother or sister caught in a, a spiritual sin, go to him. Um, but then it says to correct them gently, lest you yourself be ensnared and and that's where the passages carry one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ and and so yes I am responsible how how early in the Bible do you see that and uh, I always think of it in terms of Cain and Abel am I my brother's keeper doesn't say it in the Bible but you and I know God said absolutely positively you are responsible. And then you can be responsible for other people that are in your life. But you, that's a vocational thing. You say, what place has God put me in? Who has he put me in relationship with? For whom I am this kind of a watchman. Um, so it's the other passages in scripture um, that tell us that we are watchmen in those relationships. Um, but I'm not, I'm not a watchman for the United States of America. Okay, um, I can join a party or be politically active because I think I can do some good, but that's not what God, God has not given me that job. Um, so who are you watchmen for? You look at your vocation and say, well, where have you put me, God? Um, when, when have you had a tough time, a uh, job of confronting someone else's sin? How did you feel as you did? How did you feel after? <clears throat> Two of my uh, godchildren are currently living in sin, and I struggle with you know confronting them. I pray for them all the time, but it's like with any young people, they always know better. So it's very hard. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I think what I found in that situation, Mark, is that it's it's helpful um, to point out. Um, the the blessing and lack of blessing of that little piece of paper called a wedding certificate. Um, so besides the fact that um, well, and I, the other thing that I've been I'm very cautious about is saying that they're living in sin. Do they have a lifelong commitment to each other before God? If they do, then they're technically in the eyes of God married. And then they're not living in sin, but I still would encourage them to get married. Why? Why? What comes with that little piece of paper? All kinds of legal rights. You know? <clears throat> if, for instance, Jerry and I were living together and we were involved in a serious accident and she was sent to the hospital and Karen was her nurse, Karen would not be able to tell me anything about her medical condition unless I could prove that she had made her durable power of attorney for medical. Right? Because I'm not her husband. In other words, all of those things, all, you know, if I want to take care of my wife, I, that little piece of paper enables me to do it in a way that I can't without that piece of paper. If we're if we're um, um, married, then we get some tax benefits. If we're married, we also um, there's some inheritance and. Um, I, an example I always use with couples that are living together is say, well, um, I, I always wish I would have cut this piece of paper, uh, piece, this uh, little piece out of the paper, but it was, I remember it was two cops, I want to say one was in, they were in two suburbs, like West Dallas and, or maybe one of them was Milwaukee. They had been, in, according to the paper, they had been engaged for three, year, three years, they bought a house together. And then one of them died very, very suddenly. And the reason it was in the paper is that the other um, person in the relationship, their family was suing for that half of the house because that none of that legally belonged to the living partner. And um, 
Yeah. And, and you know, it's more those things, I think, that often, when they start thinking about the ramifications, how am I going to take care of my spouse? Because, um, you know, your relatives could do that. They could say, yeah, you, you invested that money, but it still goes to the next of kin. And, um, yeah, so there's, there's a lot of reasons to get that little piece of paper. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's it's hard, and and I think one of the the one one of the ways to be able to do that is to come out of concern. You know, it's it's a matter of here's what I see, and here's why I think you'd be better off if you were in this condition versus in this condition. Not, you know, like I said, if they're if they're committed to each other and it's very public and it's before family and friends and it's for life there probably would be considered married in God's eyes. Because you got to remember in the Bible there were no such things as marriage certificates that weren't legal marriages. Legal marriages were a relatively modern creation. Actually, in the Roman government, primarily because of people getting divorced and then there were disputes about property. Um, but uh, but in... Uh, um, Earlier days, it was just a, it was a public ceremony, but there was nothing legal about it in terms of registering with the government. That's relatively modern invention. You know, and you can see some of these things in some of these you know, true crime shows or stories, you know, where they're, they're living together and one of them is in a serious accident and is now in a coma. And it's the, let's say it's the woman and her parents want certain things done medically and they have more rights, they have the rights than this boyfriend who is not her husband. But my and husband, there's a big conflict yeah. because he wants one thing and they want another and it's all at odds and that's because they aren't married. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, Judy. Uh, going back to the question originally, um, the how did you feel, I, I think, well for me, it's nervous. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, how is this person going to take it? Yeah. Am I... Well, am I really right in bringing this up this at this time? And um, so nervous. Yeah. <laughs> um, how would uh, I'm thinking of a specific instance? How did I feel afterwards? It was a great relief because it was a burden I was carrying and couldn't. Like you're saying, you're praying for the people. Uh, yet you feel like am I supposed to be doing more? Am I supposed mm -hmm. to be doing more? So I think there is a relief. And I told the person in advance, I'm nervous about saying this to you because I, you know, I don't want you to think I'm judging like, you. I'm just yeah. telling you this is what I see. See, yeah. Now, can I put something else on here? Yeah, yeah. This doesn't have to do with this question. Where that diagram, I, I don't think what I'm thinking of fits on that diagram. When the Lord says, turn from your sin and live, right. where do you draw that? Well, he's, he's drawing you <laughs> in the very act of calling you to repentance. Okay. See, he's, he's, it's, what we believe is that it's through the power of the word, right? But, okay, but now you make the decision to turn from right. um, Well, and then, then what, I like the way one person explained it. It's this way. On the front of the door, it says, believe, turn, repent. But then when you get inside and look back over the top of the door, it says, no one says Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. You've got to hold both of those teachings in tension. You can't say it's one or the other. And this is a, a big difference between a uh, really Western way of thinking and Eastern way of thinking. Westerns are either or. Eastern is both and. And if you think about the faith, um, we talk about the paradoxes. I'm both a sinner and a saint at the same time. It's not either or, it's both and. And, and so yes, I'm I, 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 I have turned, but I realize it was the Holy Spirit who was doing his work in my heart that 
led me to that turning. Well, and turning wouldn't do you any good if it weren't for Jesus saving. Saving, so, yeah. So the fact that you're turning is basically showing that you believe that your sins are forgiven. It's right. And I'm thinking of I'm thinking of Christians who fall away and then come back, back return. Yeah. And God is, so that repentance um, and that turning can happen at the beginning, and God willing, it stays that way. But certainly people, that's that's another, um, um, oh, you know, that's this P. It's not predestination, it's perseverance. Now it's just coming to me. Because they believe once saved, always saved. You can't ever fall away. And you're like, wait a minute, you know? Because in the Bible, there's instances of people who have fallen away and come back. Um, yeah, I was thinking predestination, but now you, that you said that, that's what that is. That's perseverance. That that once you come to faith, you can't fall away. And uh, most people know enough people who have had that experience to say, oh yeah, it happens. The other side of that is, is, has someone ever confronted you about your attitudes or your actions? How did you feel? <laughs> and how did you feel about them? How do you think they felt? It's a tough job, you know? And, and that's why I appreciate so much how Scripture does it. Whenever it talks about confronting a brother, it's always gently, with patience. Jesus uh, famously in, misquoted uh, statement from Matthew 7 in the Sermon on the Mount is, don't judge or you will not be judged. But the immediate next statement is, not, he doesn't mean don't judge at all, but he says, make sure you take the log out of your own eye so that you can see clearly to pick the speck out of your brother's eye. And, and I think, as much as you can when you have a confrontation, it's important that they understand that you're doing it in love. And it's not just what you say, it's also how you say it. Um, are you approaching them with a, a humble heart? Because probably if you're confronting them, you have a certain relationship with them and they also know you pretty well, so they know all your foibles. <laughs> <laughs> they've seen you fall a few times you know and, and so you, you, you don't go in like I'm holier than thou you go in like I'm a I'm a sinner like you and um, I need I need people to do this in my life and I hopefully am doing this in a healthy way in your life um, it's not just what you say it's how you say it sometimes when people have had a, a, a difficult relationship and they want to address it um, one of the things I'll encourage them to do is write it out um, because you'll probably choose your words more carefully that way um, and very often I've been invited in to proof it <laughs> to edit it and because I'll see things in there that maybe they won't see I say well that might be not the best way to say it how about saying it this way you're still communicating the same thing but the you know, there are certain words that might ignite a, a reaction. What you're trying to do is eliminate as many of those words, um, as many of those statements as possible, and say it in the kindest way. And, um, and that's where very often when you do have a confrontation, it is helpful to have somebody else come alongside you that you trust uh, to, do, to do that, but it's got to be somebody who can handle it, you know. Um, otherwise, people use that uh, that reason as an excuse to gossip about somebody. When somebody comes and complains to me, first thing I'll ask them is, did you talk to that person yourself? And the second thing I'll ask them is, why are you telling me? You know? Why are you telling me? What's your aim? What are you aiming at? Um, if you're coming to me to say, I've got this problem with this person and I need help to deal with it, I'm glad to step in and help. If you're just coming to tell me how bad this person is, then, yeah, then our conversation's done. 
because, and, and I think a lot of times when you set a boundary like that, it helps that other person recognize whether what they're doing is helpful or, or not. Okay, let's jump into quickly <laughs> the Romans 14 passage, because um, I did want to just kind of look at that a little bit. This is, it's a long section of scripture, so I encourage you before Sunday to read the whole section which is from chapter 14, verse 1 through 15, verse 13. Um, we're not going to read all that for the epistle lesson on Sunday because it's just too, too long. So let's read uh, verses 10 to 20 responsively, and then if you'll go to Romans, we'll um, just address a few questions before our time's up here. You then, why do you judge your brother or sister? Why do you treat them with contempt? For we will all stand before God's judgment seat. It is written, As surely as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bow before me, every tongue will acknowledge God. So then each of us will give an account of ourselves to God. Therefore, let us stop passing judgment on one another. And instead, make up your mind not to any son of God or obstacle in the way of brothers. I'm convinced, being fully persuaded in the Lord Jesus, that nothing is unclean in itself. But if anyone regards something as unclean, then for that person it is unclean. If your brother or sister is distressed because of what you eat, you are no longer acting in love. So do not by your eating destroy someone for whom Christ died. Therefore do not let what you know is good to be spoken of as evil. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Because anyone who serves Christ in this way is pleasing to God and receives human approval. Do not destroy the work of God for the sake of food. All food is clean. So what food or drink has ever been forbidden to you? Sometimes medical reasons, Jerry had some blood drawn this morning, so she was on a fast, right? Had a fast, uh, fasting blood draw. Yeah, or if you've ever had a colonoscopy. <laughs> or surgery, right? Uh, you don't want to eat anything. Or if you're on certain medications, you can't eat certain foods. Foods, yeah. Yeah, grapefruit's a big one on that one. Yeah. <laughs> so um, just recognizing that happens. And this is a, a, a food or drink kind of issue. And let me just set the context a little bit. So there's... There are two different issues here that uh, Paul might have been referring to. In the context, at the very end in chapter 15, he's going to talk about uh, Gentiles and Jews. So obviously, the Jews who were in the early church had still many of the very strict dietary rules that came along with Judaism about clean and unclean foods, what's kosher and not, and that kind of stuff, right? Um, they also had a lot of, he's going to talk in another part, not about food, but about days. They had things like Day of Atonement and Festival of Pentecost and uh, Feast of Tabernacles and all of the Jewish feasts, which many of them were continuing to carry out um, during uh, the early church. And there are Messianic Jews who still practice those feasts today, but obviously inspired with a... Uh, are infused with, with a Christian understanding of those feasts, if you've ever been to a Christ in the Passover kind of thing, okay? Um, so there are a lot of those kind of things that happen um, in the early church, and so you had some believers who grew up in that tradition and they were doing those things and others who didn't. And the danger was, um, uh, if you ate some non-kosher food, and I'm a kosher-believing Christian, and I say, what in the world do you think you're doing? You know? Or if uh, you celebrate uh, the Day of Atonement and I don't, 
I say, what's wrong with you? That was old Jewish stuff. We're all done with that now because Jesus is here, you know. Um, so you've got these kind of issues going on. You also had, um, uh, and this comes up in the food um, issue in here in, in Corinthians, um, you had the possibility that you were going to eat meat that had been sacrificed to an idol in a temple. How might you eat meat that was sacrificed to a temple? Were there a couple of ways? First, um, uh, that meat, uh, some of it would end up in a, a, a meat market at a reduced price. So if you said, well, idols are nothing, and it's the same cut of meat as over here, but it's cheap, why wouldn't I be a good steward of my money and buy the cheap one instead of so I'm honoring God by buying this food that had been offered to this idol who's nothing. Mm -hmm. But other people who had just come out of idol worship would still have a connection in their faith life that says, well, I don't know that, you know, that, that was my idol and I, I don't feel good about eating it, you know, kind of thing. So that's one way. The other way is there, there were um, sometimes uh, feasts that were held in the temples with this so think about Friday fish fry at a church, okay? Um, and, and those are usually cheaper than if you go to a restaurant. So somebody might say, well, I'm being a good steward. I, I know idols don't mean anything. So I'm going to go out and, you know, maybe they had an ulterior motive of talking to somebody about Jesus. I don't know. They could have had a good reason to go join with all those. Uh, I mean, Jesus saved with sinners, didn't he? Right? I mean, there's a, you see, you can go all the way down that path, right? And, uh, and, uh, and so uh, a Christian could come into contact with that meat that had been offered to idols in a number of different ways. The other thing that could happen is you could go over to a neighbor who, say, who invites you over for dinner, and, um, and they've made the meal, and you don't know whether that meat's been offered to idols or not. And in that case, Paul says, eat what's set before you unless they say, oh, this is meat that's been offered to idols because then that person might still have this idolatry going on and you don't want to support that idolatry. It's not that it's wrong for you to eat the meat. It's just that you might be sending the wrong message to this person who is your, your host. So, but he says, if, you, if nothing is said, just go ahead and eat it because you know that idols are... Nothing. They're a bunch of wood and stone, you know, maybe ivory, um, gold, whatever they are. So what are some of the disputable matters that divide the church today? Well, obviously things like. <laughs> now, we would say these are not disputable matters, though. Why? Because God says something about them. You know, I don't know when you when you read all the promises that are there about baptism, how some, somebody can, and, and it's all about God to us. You know, I don't I don't get how somebody can say, well, it's something I do for God when all the promises, you know, even the the very simple ones that we use, repent, and, uh, Peter, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This promise is for you and for your children. It's not a promise from me to God. It's a promise from God to me. So I don't know how somebody doesn't read those and say, wait a minute, it can't be this. It has to be this, you know? But there are things that are disputable matters that divide the church today. What might they be? Well, St. John's is next. <laughs> I'm talking about in the church general today, what are some disputable matters that people argue about? Baptism. Baptize right away or wait until somebody decides. Well, but that's, see, I don't think that's, uh, Jesus says repent and be baptized. And uh, Joel calls even infants to repentance in his call to faith. That's why I hand uh, parents, um, I don't know if we've gone through that in here. Um, infant faith? Yeah, yeah I think we did. Yeah. So but anyways... Um, women, women pastors, this one that divides the general church. It divides the general church, but there again, I think God has spoken. Right. right. It's just, right. are you going to listen? Well, yeah, yeah, people still argue about it. But they argue about it. But what I'm talking about, things that people argue about that aren't in the Bible. Oh. 
you've heard me say, if it ain't in the Bible, I really don't cup care. The, the cup or the, just the, the Individual cup or common cup. Yeah, that's yeah. Do we know what Jesus used? We don't know. He could have had, he, there could have been a cup at every place, and he could have meant take this cup, because it was a cup after a meal and a typical... Um, uh, in a typical Seder, everybody has their own cup. But so he could have. <laughs> the Holy Grail. <laughs> or he could have said, take this cup and pass it. Right. We don't. Right. No, you don't fight about that because it doesn't matter. Yes. Politics. Pardon? Politics. Politics. Yeah. Politics in the church. Yeah. Um, so, uh, what is the God ordained way to run a church? And the answer is. There ain't any. Well, Should we run like, uh, is, is there anything wrong with uh, the way the, the, the Catholic Church, um, what other ones, the Orthodox churches, the Methodist churches, where there's an archbishop or some kind of leader who appoints the pastor in a place? No. And there's, there's some evidence that there's a little bit of that going on because uh, Paul tells Timothy to appoint elders in every place. But on the other hand, sometimes there's an election, mm -hmm. like we do it. Uh, you know, that's, who owns the church? Uh, I mean the property. Right. Is it the local congregation or is it the denomination? Doesn't say in the Bible, mm -hmm. you know? Oh, that's and, and that's a big contention. Right now there's a bunch of Methodists who are leaving the Methodist church because of the issue of the gay, mm -hmm. lesbian kind of stuff. Um, and much like some of the ELCA churches left a few years back over that same issue. Um, but um, one of the problems is that in both the ELCA and the Methodist church, who owns the church? And usually there's a pretty significant hurdle to, to cross. I think it's, it was a two-thirds or three-quarters in the Methodist church have to vote in favor and then the church body has to say, okay, we're going to let you keep the property. In the ELCA, I believe, uh, from what I've read and seen, um, it takes two votes of at least two-thirds of the members of the church saying we're going to go. And I think they have two votes because that way if it gets voted in once, you know, well, now word's going to get out and maybe those people are saying, what did, what did those people do? You know, and they're all going to come to the next voters meeting and... You know, and they've got to clear that hurdle twice. Um, that's a big, it's, but the Bible doesn't say. The Bible doesn't say. There are a lot of things the Bible doesn't speak to. It's, you know, I, I say even for a pastor, you know, when you've, I've handed out that Bible study here, it, there's three ways. You can appoint, you can elect, or what's the third way? You can put two names in a hat, cast lots, and pull one out. That's what they did for the replacement for Judas, right? And all of those were legit. So I, I think that's an area. Well, another place is just, um, just within our, our denomination is the Austin, Concordia Austin. Right. They're, you know, they say they're separate and distinct. It's their property. It's their property there. And, and the thing is, is the Bible doesn't say anything about that, does it? No. I'm trying to find a place. You're, well, it tells you to be subject, subject to the authority that are there, but what they're arguing about is who's the ultimate authority. Is it the Board of Regents down there, or is it Synod? And, and because it's, it's a messy way that colleges relate to Synod, it's not an easy question to settle. And you're never going to say, thus saith the Lord about that. You've got to go to your bylaws and the regulations of maybe the state or the national laws to, uh, to figure that out. Um, a big one is uh, worship style. Right. You know? Yeah. Even whether you should use instruments or not, or what instruments you should use, because there have been church bodies that did not use any instruments at all. They're, I think they call the Church of Christ. It's, it's one of the ones down south. And, you know, they believe it's wrong to use any instruments. Well, the Amish are like that. The Orthodox and the Russian Orthodox, they don't use instruments. They're all chants. Everything's chanted. Everything's yeah, so you're, you're um, you know, the and, and the, the reality is that most things were chanted because they didn't use a lot of instruments 
the organ didn't come in about till about uh, I think it was 900 AD because some emperor gave one to the Pope and he decided he liked it and set a couple of monasteries about making pipe organs. You know, it, but it, uh, Christianity existed for about a thousand years without having a pipe organ in the church. They used them in the Colosseum. They were, you know, think Calliope at the circus. They were that kind of a pipe, mm -hmm. but they weren't used for worship so until. That would be offensive. <laughs> so, you know, I mean, yeah, you, you just, there's just so many things like that. Even, you know, when I do an, uh, uh, is there a baptismal rite in the, in the Bible? Now, you used mine, which is a combination of LW and the old baptismal rite from TLH. I don't like the new ones. I can give you re theological reasons why, but, um, but I, I, I use these. I, I, because there's no baptismal right in the Bible. The only thing I do is baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Uh, right? Okay. And apply you apply water in the name of the triune God and the, whoever it is, kid or adult, is baptized. Everything else is adiaphora. You know? Um, so a, a lot of our, our things like that are just adiaphora. The right of installation. Can you find a right of installation in the Bible? No. Uh, all man-made things. All man-made things. And, and, and so people get kind of bent out of shape about a lot of those man-made things. And, um, and that's why I just encourage you, don't get bent out of shape. Um, that's you know. not the way we do it. <laughs> uh, that's, done it that was the point of my article in the newsletter. Right. You got a new pastor come and let him lead. Um, but and, but call him to lead you in love and call him to uh, to give him a chance. Don't say just because it, it didn't work 20 years ago, it's not going to work now. You just you you got to give him a chance to to lead. And and again, it's one thing if I've always said to anybody who's joined the church of mine, you know, you got a right to judge anything that comes out of my mouth on a Sunday morning, but you better know your Bible. Because um, that's the bottom line. Not add to, not take away from what God has said. Um, and the key, I think, is to judge without being judgmental. God does call us to make judgments. Um, uh, let's ask him to give us grace to do that. So, Lord God, Heavenly Father, we thank and praise you for the blessing that we have of being your watchman in the vocations that you've called us to and uh, that you also have called us to live in love with each other guided and directed uh, solely by your word we ask lord that you would bless us to be a body of believers who will do just that to let your word rule and reign in our hearts and uh, uh, among our our churches that it would that your word would also guide us when we need to be a watchman for somebody and when it's not really something that's um, a part of your word and something we're responsible for being a watchman for in somebody else's life help us see the difference between uh, a deadly sin and a mere difference or disagreement and then lord keep our our own hearts uh, wise to what is a deadly sin and what is uh, just the difference in as we think about uh, the power and promise of your word, help us to so live uh, in the lives of those around us that uh, we give witness to our trust in you and that we don't do anything to throw a stumbling block in their way. We ask it in the precious and powerful name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Yeah, for the